Bill Gates in the 1990s coined the term the digital nervous system. And he said that we as humans can take in an amazing amount of information, process it within split seconds, and make decisions. And he said, as a digital nervous system, why cannot organizations make decisions in real time or very, very quickly? And that really got me thinking. This was a number of years ago. And I thought, how, how do we get to a point where an organization can actually think and make decisions? So what I'm going to go through today is dispel a few myths around data and also take you through a model and an approach that you can actually take away some practical advice of how to build a strategy and have direction around what you should do with data. So just a little summary about myself. Uh, I've worked as an independent contractor for a number of years. Um, I used to build uh, data warehouses, BI, ETL. I did all that good stuff. Um, I ran scrums and was an agile master, project management. And over the last number of years, been really focusing on architecture, the design of things. And recently, I'm working with Santander, heading up their digital data practice. Uh, we have a pretty big team, 130 people, uh, who are building out the bank's big data platform. I also do um, boutique consultancy in strategy advisory. That's just a little bit about me. So I think everybody's seeing this stuff, right? The future of banking is data, identity and privacy. That's Tom's Blumsfield from Monzo. The future of banking is data and customer experience. Great. I love all these words. The future is data. We're not really touching upon what the strength and the power of data really is. Data is the building blocks and ingredients of human intellect. Data within context is information. Information that can benefit you is knowledge. And knowledge that you know is true, you've seen the cycle of life, is wisdom. That's why generally your parents, they know stuff. You think they're wrong, but they just had experience of seeing knowledge manifest. So they have become wise just by the cycle of life. But really, this is much, much bigger than this. If we go back in time, for hundreds of years, the Eastern Hemisphere, from around the six, 700 years uh, BC, uh, AD, for about 700 years, was thriving in arts, uh, maths, science, engineering. And then all of a sudden, over the space of 100, 150 years, at the time of the Renaissance, it all shifted. And the Western Hemisphere began thriving. And prior to that, the Western Hemisphere were farmers and Vikings, and they weren't doing much. What actually was it? A very interesting book called The Quantification of Western Europe. And he basically says that what the West started doing, they started measuring things. So when people came on board, they took down their name and their address and where they came from, how old they were. They had records and lists. So they actually started measuring when they navigated the seas. How long did I travel? My position according to the sun. And by measuring the terrain and measuring almost everything, that allowed them to quantify what they were doing and actually come up with better methods. And it pushed all of human intellect. It's big picture thinking. Now we're on a precipice where the access to data is phenomenal. We can know in very quickly where you live, what you do, who you like, what interests you have, where you shop, where you work, who you email. The abundance of data now has another turning point that it can really change what we think and how we process information. That's just very high level. Now let's get a little bit to the agenda that we've got today. So the number of years now, six, seven, eight years, I've been going on and I've been having a war with data and trying to tell people what the power of this thing really is. And I think that the world is deluded, absolutely deluded. I mean, even today, we talk about data science and we had a, you know, a speaker up here talking about, let's not focus on the technology. We talk about data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. These are very advanced capabilities. Most organizations don't even know what data they have. They don't know what it means. They don't know how it's structured. They don't even know how it's defined. A simple column, name. Is it customer name, last name, first name, middle name, maiden name? 
They don't even know the basics. So we are talking about some very high-level capabilities when the foundational elements absolutely don't exist. So to put it into context, we don't know why we're doing stuff. The drivers and motivation from a business perspective are just not clearly articulated. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know why they're doing this data science project. They've got a use case. That's, is that it? Is that the end of it? They don't have a business model or an operating model. How do I organize myself to deliver this stuff? It doesn't exist. There's a divide between a CEO's great vision and his exco and the people who are running the teams to do stuff. There's a massive divide. There's no joining of this. The capabilities that are necessary are all the advanced stuff, and we haven't got some of the basics in place. So we don't know what capabilities we should be focusing on. People are not accountable for what they're delivering. And then what they're delivering at the end, we can't trace it back. We can't say that that big data platform that you now built is actually giving us the benefit that we thought it'd give. But more than that, we keep looking for a magic pill. Big data, data science, artificial intelligence, a master data management solution, all of these data warehouse, enterprise data warehouse. There's no magic pill. You have to do the hard work. You have to manage your data as if it is truly an asset. We have decades of IT silos. Let me ask, how long have you been investing in IT? 20 years, 30 years? How many systems do you have? How long have you invested in understanding the data in those systems? A year? Six months? So you've had 30 years of bringing all this IT infrastructure, all these systems, all these databases in, and now you want to exploit the data that's in them. It's, it's quite a lot of work to get that done now, right? So we built it up. The world's greatest data technology. What is it? Kafka? Python? Scala? It's Excel. It is Excel. And I give this example, you will have 20 people in our organization, 20 people that look after all the infrastructure, the platforms, the Oracle databases. We'll have 100 people that are creating software, APIs, analytics, reporting engines. That's in IT. We have 500 people in the business munging data. We call them data terrorists. They're taking data from here, putting it in Excel, from here, from here. And there's a whole cottage factory. If you want to look for savings, it's not in IT. It's in the business, finance, risk, and marketing. These are your key players. They have a Bob, and he knows what that database means. And they have a Bob, and they have a Bob. That's where all the people are utilizing this data. Pricing analysts, risk analysts, credit scores. All of this has been done there. We have many, many data programs. Do we recognize that the data programs? We are doing a massive financial crime transformation program. 150 projects within that one program. What's the alignment across all of these different initiatives that we're doing that have a data element? Do we know what they are? Or are we just going to piecemeal, do some data, do some data, do some data? How do we know that we're doing the right thing? Haven't got a clue because we can't trace back to actually what are we trying to achieve. And then finally, data is an asset. Come on. If it was an asset, and I give this example. We see that money is an asset, right? So what we do is that we have a chief financial officer and an entire function dedicated to managing that finance. We want to know where it goes, what state it's in, how good is it, is it liquid, are we owed? Every single penny I want to know and be able to trace it. Do we have something like that for data if it's an asset? No. So, let's go right back. Right, right, far back. Sun Tzu, the art of war. And what I've done is I've taken Sun Tzu and I've architected Sun Tzu. So I hope you enjoy what I'm trying to do here. And he said that it's a grave affair of state. That means this stuff is really serious. Fintechs are attacking your market share. It's a matter of survival and extinction. How long is it until they take so much of your market that you are no longer in business? Because they have 50 people and you have 5,000 and they can do what you do. So he said it's a matter that should be pondered carefully. Are we really pondering carefully and spending the time to think? Or do we just do? Just create a platform, implement blockchain. Most of the time, probably a CRM database will probably do the trick. Right? But we jump to technology, we jump for the shortcuts. We're not thinking it through. And he said there are five fundam fundamentals for this deliberation, making comparisons and figuring it out. Those five fundamentals, the way, 
How do I ensure that my organization, all of us, are heading in one direction? If I'm a military general and I've got half my troops over there and a third of them over there and some of them over there, I have, it doesn't matter what I do. I might know I need to flank them, but they're just not joined up. So can we be of one mind and work in one direction? How do we do that? It's not just going to work through talking. It doesn't work through talking. So that's your dead strategy. Heaven, what does good look like? What is it? What's our operating model for us to deliver this value and deliver this uh, initiative that we're thinking of doing, this goal? Earth, so military general, he assesses his conditions. Right? He looks at the weather. Is there fog forming? He looks at the terrain. Are there places where it's high? We take that. What's our current state? How much data do we have? What's our inventory? How many applications and technology? How many people, how many processes do we actually have here? Understand the terrain. For me, the understanding of the current state is even more important than the target because I can do something, it's real. And then the target state. So I've, I've, I've jumped a little bit with Sun Tzu here. And he speaks around command and discipline. But what does the future look like? Can I, can I touch it and feel it? Or does it just remain something conceptual? Can I create models that articulate and get people to understand what this target state looks like? Even if it's technology or data, whatever it is. And then how do I deliver this? What's my discipline around this roadmap and plan that I want to now execute? So this is what I'm going to run through today and, and show you some of the models that will help you articulate this journey. So we'll start off with the motivation model. So this is just high level. These are the models. So I'm a data guy. Data is intangible. So what do I do with my data? I visualize it. That's why you have dashboards and reporting engines, right? Why do we not visualize our conversations and structure our conversations? This is why we use models. We are visual creatures. You're probably going to remember more of how I've said something than the actual content of what I'm going to say. So can we visualize it so we can focus on something with our eyes and take it in? Because it helps us with common language. It helps us structure our thinking. So we will use models to articulate this entire journey and bring people on the journey with us. So our operating model, capability map, I'll explain what I mean by a capability, assessment of those capabilities and target states, and then overall implementation roadmap. So data strategy, really, right. So what we have, most fintechs will be down here, technology strategy, IT strategy, that's what they're doing. The technology will drive data, it'll have some data that it collects, and that will in infer what my business direction will be. Great. There's a two-way relationship between these strategies here. And you could probably put digital strategy that goes across the side. The reality is, how many people know what their business is actually trying to achieve? You know what it is. They want more profits, more customers, less costs, work faster, improve productivity. It's not a strategy. It's not a strategy. In banking, it's difficult, right? We're a highly commoditized market. It's difficult to differentiate. Take the example of retail. Um, back in the UK, we'd have if it's about customer loyalty, go to Tesco. I go get some fuel, they give me points, I can use that to buy food. And they're really around the customer. I want high product quality, I'll go to Waitrose. It costs a little bit more, but I'll get, really get quality. I want speed, and it's cheap, I'll go to Aldi. It's very clear in retail. In banking, it's not so clear, so how do we differentiate ourselves as a business? IT, build it and they will come. Here you go, SAP. Here you go, Data Lake. Now go fill your boots. That's what happens today. And then let's do, a data, uh, let's do some data science. That, that's your data strategy at the moment, right? These things need to work together. Your business direction informs the data that you will need. And I'm fighting that every single application and technology that you have is just a medium for storing, reading data. That's all it is. Your CRM system, you put some data into it and you look at it. Customer call center, someone calls, they bring up the customer name. Every application is just a medium to access data. So why are we not using the needs that I need to drive my business, the data I need to drive my business, to choose my application? When have you chosen technology based on the data that it will provide you? You don't do that. So how do I get all of these things that I'm trying to do into one schematic, one model? The business motivation model from the open group. It's, it's, think of it as like a data model. Now, what I can do, very high level, we've got quite a lot to get through, understand what's influencing and motivating my direction. Is it regulation? 
Is it technology and fintech, blockchain? It could be an influencer. Great, but there's lots of other influencers. My customer market is changing. My demographics have identified something. Assess them. What's important? You can't solve all the world's problems. You have to do some kind of assessment. Simple SWOT. What's my risk and reward? What should I focus on? Then now we can start talking about means and ends. The mission. What's our purpose? What are we here really to do? Vision. What do we want to be when I grow up? What's my target state? I may never get there, but it inspires people to work towards it. These words have meaning. And then goals and objectives. Within five minutes, people could come up and make some goals. Right? Are they coherent? Are they correct? Are they aligned? This stuff takes thinking. But we don't, we don't view goals and objectives in that way. We just say, put some stuff down. They all need to line up. That's what's going to give you direction. And then your policies and your rules are part of this. How do you instantiate it and move it? I recommend having a look at this one. In Santander, our vision. So I'm just going to be touching upon a few examples of what we've done. Two words for us. Organize information. That's it. Forget all the rest of it. Want to, we need to organize information. So our efforts, our initiatives are around organizing information. Now, I give this example. For many years, you've been putting things in your loft. Yeah, you have children, their clothes, like, I'm going to have another child in a couple of years, I'll store them in the loft. Those kitchenware, my tools are up there. Over many years now, I've got lots and lots of things in my loft. I put my head up. Holy cow. <laughs> now what am I going to do? There's so much stuff in there, I can't find what I want. So, you've got a couple of choices. You could move house. That's one choice. You could clear your loft, throw it all away, start again. What you'd probably do is that you take some boxes, you'd go up there, and you put labels on the boxes. Clothes, age six, age eight, age three. You start classifying and categorizing your boxes in the loft. This is what we need to do. We need to classify and categorize the data that's available, our inventories, then we know what we have. And that's the major focus. What it means, how it's structured, how it's defined, where is it, where did it come from? We've put together 15 goals, quite a lot, but we have some element of focus. Now, one key thing, what I'm going to run through, you could do it in a couple of weeks. You could spend a year doing it. It's a matter of resolution, a matter of detail. Something quickly can give you some element of direction, and you know what it kind of looks like and feels like. The more important it is, the more time you will spend on it. So I'll just take an example, um, improve speed of finding and understanding data. This is an initiative I'm currently running, a data marketplace. We have some kind of metadata repository for the data lake. We have something that we brought for RDA. We have something that we brought in for GDPR. So we have metadata in a couple of different repositories. Number one, we should have one. So the data marketplace concept is that if anybody wants to find any data in this organization, they go to one place. They can search by CRM. They can search by customer. That's the name of the data. They can search by the table name, the application name, the database name, the server name. All of them, all these things, there's a meta model behind it. They're all joined together. That's one of our goals. I'll just give you an example of the way we've cut them as understand goals, so understanding the data, managing it, controlling and exercising authority over it, and then exploiting it, utilizing it for business value. So that's how we've had a theme around our goals. This is a model that I have proprietary put together and is taking into account a number of industry standard models. So this is our value model on a page where we talk about the value streams, the high level processes that we want to do. And I'll just give you an example. What I'm going through now is strategy to portfolio. This is the things that we need to do to plan. Requirement to deployment. This is almost every piece of requirement that you receive and you deploy infrastructure. You create a table, create an API, it goes through requirements, analysis, design, build, deploy, right? That encapsulates that entire process. Request to fulfill. Once it's operational, we need to look, maintain it. Things happen. That encapsulates all of those processes. And then a detector current control. It used to be detector correct, but we want to control anomalies. It could be a data quality issue, it could be a server that went down. All of that, we have a process and understanding at the high level how it interacts with everything else. And data to action. 
The value of data is that you've got it in a report. Now you actually probably, you should be doing something with it. What do you do? Does it inform our campaign marketing strategy or our churn rate? Do I measure that? And then there's a cycle. Once I've created an action, that will probably create more data and I start the cycle again. How do we capture what happens when somebody has a report or some analytics? So there's a process for that. Our operating model are these building blocks. I'm not going to go through them. And then the capabilities that support all of this. Our aim, the value proposition, is that we provide the bank to understand, manage, and exploit its data. And we are now focused on what we call bimodal analytics. Systems of agility. So your data lake should be a system of agility. It should be fast. I don't mind duplication in there, as long as I know it. Things that we can turn around quickly, and our enterprise data warehouse takes time. We have to agree. It has to be accurate. It has to be trusted. So we have systems that we differentiate. Now, if you look at Gartner Pace layering, it has this same kind of concept. I've taken from Gartner Pace layering. And they say that these systems that have different life cycles will actually need completely separate teams. Their funding model is different. Their life cycle is different. Their speed is different. Their governance is different. Everything is different. So do we separate them? Now we will actually start thinking about separating these things and having different teams with different skill sets for these two types of systems. This is an example. Our target operating model on a page. So these value streams, these are the processes, high level processes. These are what every single thing else in my entire operating model needs to speak to. It needs to be aligned. So the rest of it are all building blocks that join to fulfill these value streams. And we talk about suppliers. So now, right now, we're shifting our operating model from doing everything in-house to having supplier and multi-procurement relationships. Which suppliers do I need? I want to outsource things that are commodity, that don't give me any advantage. Things that will give my company a competitive advantage, I want to build that in-house. And things that I don't really know, and maybe I need to partner with them. So let's have the right people doing the right thing. And that's a shift just from suppliers. Our organization structure. How do we change that? What's the right structure that we need to fulfill these value streams? And then at the bottom here, management system. Governance, performance management, funding. How does this work? And we have pockets of funding, BAU, project change. It's difficult to get money. If this is important, we need to figure that out. So one of the things I've done in here is that we've come up with a concept called Data Champions. And these are people within every single business unit across the bank. Forget the owners and stewards for a minute. These are people on the ground who actually go and say, in that database, this is the data in there. In this, in the mortgages domain, this is what they're trying to achieve. So I'm going to document that system. They're actually doing the work and bringing that metadata in for us. So that's a change. The operating, how is that funded? Because all the business units don't want to spend on those full-time roles. So we've fund, funded it centrally, initially with a view that once they understand that it's valuable, because each business domain wants to improve its data maturity, they'll start funding it from their own budgets. But we have to have an idea of how we're going to fund all of this. How are we going to manage performance? The directive hierarchy. We, just, we have principles that are not aligned to our policies, standards and frameworks. There's a, what we call a directive hierarchy. It, these, all these things need to be joined up. If I have an intention, a principle, guiding behavior, the policy is the instantiation, making that real. You have to do it. And then you have business rules that you probably put into your systems. There's an entire hierarchy here. And we want to encapsulate our operating model around this. So that's just operating model on a page. Now, in terms of understanding your current state, we keep talking about analytics, all this kind of stuff. Look, there are three or four major frameworks that exist that will allow you to look at how good your data is. I would say, pick one of these frameworks and implement it. At Santander, we've gone a step further. We've introduced the concept of capability. Capability is a conceptual building block that acts as a Rosetta Stone. I can look at it from a process perspective. You can look at it from a business perspective. Tech, data, it brings them all together. I won't spend too much on that. We can talk about it if you have any questions. These capabilities, we've defined our own data capability map. This is level one. What do I need to manage data? These are all the things that I need to do. Some of them are more important than others. The capability map is what we map every single thing against. Our goals, our objectives, our programs, our frameworks, our technologies. 
It's the one common building block. It allows me to look at my data organization and my data capabilities as Lego blocks. This is how it's broken down. I guarantee if I said, what's business intelligence? For 30 people, I would have 30 different definitions. We have now said, what is it? And I obviously haven't broken it down as BI. So we now have a definition for every one of these, an outcome for every one of these. We have used this to align group and seven other countries across the globe in terms of this is the stuff that we need to do to manage data. We have a framework that we can all agree on. So what is data governance? What's it involve? And then we went through a process of maturing it. How good is it? We used industry model from CMMI, level one to five. And it's a fact-based method to say what's real. You can say, right, our technology department don't have the skills or our tools are not great. But this is a fact-based method. And we come up with our current state. Each of the little blocks underneath the big one, people process data technology. So we assessed it. Our people, do they have the skills? Are there enough of them? Our technology, is it rubbish or is it business value adding? Our data, we don't have it. Or does it actually provide us with competitive advantage? Those each have a level of one to five. And technology, process, is process ad hoc? Or do we measure and consistently improve them? So each one of them gives us a score. We round up that score. And the key thing here is that these things need to work together. So for example, we have Abinitio. High maturity tool, don't have the skills to exploit it. It takes us six months to get some basic stuff done. Your maturity of your tooling and your people and your processes need to move hand in hand. So when we are talking about blockchain, high level mature technology. Well, maybe it's not that mature yet, but high level maturity required to use that, use that technology. Do we have the skills? Are the processes within our organization are lined up? Now it gives us some element of focus. Now transformation, this is the entire data transformation that we're doing on one page. So if I spoke around data architecture, today we speak of around the data lake and data maps. Our interim state, which we have to go through because you can't jump from maturity of one to three, you have to go on that journey and learn because everybody needs to come with you. So our interim state is around data models, so we will model the data, and a data ecosystem. It's not just analytics. It's transactional systems, operational APIs, it's all of it. But our target state is to have common open data. I think, you know, we mentioned before around PSD2 and open banking. Easy exchange with standard protocols of data. That's where we want to be in the cloud, so we can elastically scale an entire ecosystem. Now, that's just data architecture. Um, I, won't, I won't speak about the others, but we can talk about that later. Come on. Technology transformation. So I said the capabilities can be used in a, many, many different ways. At a high level, this is just an example. It's not the actual technologies. Can't tell that one up. But you could look at the colors. Red is kill, blue is keep it, green is change it, yellow is something new. At a high level, I can now say, for each of these capabilities, what technologies do I need, or what do I change? You can see very easily, I've got to kill a lot of stuff, and I need quite a lot of new things. And then we built our business case for investment. For each one of these capabilities, we articulated, what's the benefit? Improved productivity, FTE saving, faster, better, cheaper. And we came up with a number. So we actually could quantify the return on investment. You spend this much, we can guarantee that we can save this much. This is how the capabilities will help you. This is what we use to actually articulate it all. And then you bring it all together. So we use this on A1, we print it out, we put it with our teams so that everybody can discuss it and know these are all the things that we're doing and this is why we're doing these programs. This is why we're doing it. It's the entire purpose of what we're trying to achieve here. So, key takeaways, just to wrap up. I'm getting a stop sign as well. So, the data strategy is all around why we're doing it, socializing it, and getting people talking about it. So we've got some mediums that we can visualize it, but the best strategies are those that are in conversation, that people get it, they talk about it, it's interesting. Heaven, let's make sure that we know how all of these things come together as an operating model. The Earth, build data capabilities, not data outputs. A capability lasts, you can do things with it. You create data outputs, it's done once and it's gone. 
and then pick areas of focus. Make sure you understand, command, what works, what doesn't. This is where you fail fast. We've spoken around failing fast. We can do a POC. We want to do Azure Data Lake and put our stuff in the cloud. You can do that because you've got an idea of what your target state looks like. And finally, build business cases. This is the discipline. Measure them, quantify them, and have a line back. I delivered that. This is why, and this is the benefit. Let's make peace. That's it. Thank you very much.